Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us today on AGL Live. We have a very experienced panel lined up for you today to talk about agile transformation in government. Um, for those of you who are new to us, I just want to say a few words about AGL. We're a community-based group of people working for or with government, and our mission is to bring awareness, conversation, and resources to those bringing Agile to government. Our focus over the next few months is going to be hosting these live events. Um, next month, we've got Mark Schwartz talking about his new book, A Seat at the Table. Other topics um, for events will include DevSecOps, Agile procurements, and Scaling Agile. You can stay in touch with us to learn more about when these events are scheduled. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, we're at AgileGovLeaders, or you can visit our website, agilegovleaders.org, um, and sign up for our newsletter. And then we're also on GitHub, LinkedIn, and we have a Slack channel that anyone is welcome to join. So we're gonna get started, and um, we'll start with some brief introductions. I'm Elizabeth Raley, the Professional Services Director at Civic Actions. I'm a practicing Scrum Master, and I'm on the working group of AGL. And now I'm going to hand it to Alexa Choi, who is moderating our event today. Hi, Alexa. Hi. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. My name is Alexa Choi. I'll be your moderator today. And I am the Vice President of Business Development for Technique. And I'm also right now acting as a Scrum Master. So really excited for our conversation today. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to our panelists, starting with Rob Klopp, to introduce themselves. And right after that, we'll be doing a flash poll on what does Agile actually mean? So be looking for that, that will pop up on your screen. Please participate in the poll and we will kick, use that to kick off our entire discussion. So before that though, I will allow our panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves. So Rob, if you wanna take it away, then we'll move through the other panelists after. Sure, I'm Rob Klopp, I'm the ex-CIO and uh, Deputy Commissioner of Information Technology at the Social Security Administration. And I'm currently working as an independent consultant at the state of California, uh, trying to help modernize their Medicaid system. Perfect, thank you so much. Ann Duncan, did you wanna go next? Sure, I'm Ann Duncan. I'm the uh, CIO for the uh, County of Santa Clara and so one of Rob's customers for that Medicaid modernization. Uh, formerly the CIO for the Environmental Protection Agency and prior to that, five years in the public sector and 20 years in the private sector. Perfect, thank you so much. And how about Mike? Hey, I'm Michael Palmer. I'm with the Department of Homeland Security's Digital Service. Uh, there I lead a team of acquisition strategists and um, we go out and advise uh, DHS components on how to get better outcomes on their procurements. Uh, and uh, I've been in the government at various agencies, including GSA, EPA, and other parts of DHS for about 15 years, and industry before that. Perfect. Thank you so much. And Brent. Hi, I'm Brent Marvilio with U.S. Digital Service. I'm an acquisition strategist there. Uh, I've spent a few years in private industry, a few years as a nonprofit, and then uh, federal acquisition, different agencies for about 11 years now. Um, USDS for about a year and a half. Most recently, though, I was, uh, led a team of IT contracting officers at the EPA. Fantastic. We definitely have the group that we needed today for today's discussion. So really appreciate that. Um, so hopefully you should be seeing popping up on your screen a poll about what does Agile mean? And our panelists can probably see the poll too if you want to participate. Everybody can participate. Um, is Agile more than a buzzword in your organization? No, we claim to be Agile, but it's not meaningfully implemented, sort of. Or yes, we are Agile in our development, management, and cultural practices. <laughs> so, I really like that poll. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the poll came back, since this was a flash poll, I'll go ahead and read where everybody is. So 13% of everybody said, no, we claim to be agile, but it's not meaningfully implemented. 75% of people said, sort of, agile is used in some processes like development, but hasn't penetrated the culture fabric of the organization. And 13 said, yes, we are agile in our development, management, and cultural practices. So it sounds like most people are falling right in the middle, 
think that's a great place for us to kick off our first question, which is, is since Agile is becoming sort of a hot buzzword that means different things to different people, how can we standardize it? And what does it mean to the government and to contractors helping the government? So I'm gonna kick it, kick it off, hand it over to Rob Clapp to get started, and then we will address the other panelists after. Rob, you're muted, sorry. No, nope, I'm not muted. Oh, there we are, I can hear you. Oh, okay, you're cool. good. I'm sorry, so um, let me sort of start off by saying that, um, you know, Agile is a really interesting uh, combination of ideas that have grown over a long period of time. And it's really the philosophy that these ideas embody that's important. And my, my experience is a lot of people get hung up on the ritual of Agile and, and miss the philosophy that underlies it. Uh, so for example, uh, we were, the panelists were talking earlier and I was joking about how weird it is to go to a stand up and have everybody feel like they're obligated to stand up because it's a ritual and they don't really, and they miss the whole point. I, I think that there are a, sort of three bits to Agile that are important and the last bit is the one I think is most important in the government. Um, one bit that's important is that it's a requirement of Agile, a fundamental requirement that your end user is engaged as the product owner. I can't tell you how many folks I've seen that do Agile and you say, well, do you have a product owner? And they say, oh yeah, of course I do. My product owner accepts all of the stuff. And I said, great, who's the product owner? And they say, oh, some business analysts that are in IT. And that's not the product owner. The product owner has got to be the real product owner. It's the real end user. If you were a commercial company, the product owner would be your customers. It wouldn't be somebody in marketing. Um, the second part of Agile that I think is really important is there's some very uh, interesting um, techniques in Agile that are designed to make programmers productive. One is the idea of two-week sprints where you have to deliver something every two weeks. This is designed to stop the normal human thing of waiting to the last minute to get it all done. You have to get it done every two weeks. Um, and I think that that, that two-week sprint thing is not something that you should take lightly. People should actually be delivering code. And your product owner that I mentioned earlier should be um, reviewing that code. And then closely associated with that is the idea that you actually do product increments and deliver product increments every, say, two months or three months. Um, because after a while, two-week sprints start to become routine and people will start to slide a little bit on that. And so these product increments become short-term deadlines. And again, it's deadlines that make developers be productive. The last thing is the thing I think is um, more of a side effect of Agile, but it's the thing I think is most important. And that is what I call a product orientation. So you shouldn't do Agile projects you should be doing agile products where the idea is that um, you uh, are developing uh, incrementally and continuously improving and you never ever ever want to uh, end the, that continuous improvement cycle because the minute that you end and go into maintenance and operations uh, mode, you know, you put your software on life support you start accruing technical debt and you get to the point where you have an old legacy system you can't get rid of. The th reason it's important, this product orientation for uh, contracting is because with a product orientation, instead of a project orientation, you can sort of say, look, I'm gonna set a team of say, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have say four sprint teams of seven developers each plus some uh, associated people around them to support them. And that might end up, you might end up with an annual run rate for that team of something like $10 million a year. And, and that's really what your budget is. Your budget now is $10 million a year and it's not gonna go up or down. You're just gonna try to drive velocity as hard as you can within that $10 million budget. And if in the next year you get more money, uh, you could actually scale the team up maybe to $15 million and just increase velocity by 50%. Or if you get less money, you can drop it to 5 million and drop velocity by 50%. But the fundamental mechanics of the project don't break, which is completely different than waterfalls. So I think that those three things, um, 
absolutely have got to have a real product owner use the techniques of agile in order to get velocity out of your development team and uh, use a product orientation in order to manage the finances and budget that, that, to me that's the gist of agile sounds good thank you so much for that rob i appreciate it and duncan i'm going to come around to you next okay um so thanks uh, I think the just a couple key points about agile as a buzzword versus something we're really doing. Uh, I think that a lot of people do in fact use agile as a buzzword and the really important things about agile are number one it's a cultural change right agile really is all about culture and if culture of how you do your work doesn't change you can't really implement agile because if you're particularly in a government organization where um, decisions have been made typically from the top down and the project manager makes all the decisions um, or even an executive above the project manager, uh, when you get an agile project team that's empowered to self-manage essentially, um, and you don't change the culture around them, you're gonna end up in trouble. And we've seen, that, I've seen this in the past in organizations where I've worked with our customers, where we get this agile team together, uh, but the, the middle managers uh, end up being a blockage towards agile being success, successful. The other thing I wanna mention before we move on is simply, um, that we get a lot of people who say they're doing Agile and they are in fact doing Agile fall. I think this is a really um, big risk in the government, right, where we want to um, know everything we're doing up front. We think that's a way to reduce our risk by knowing how to solve all the problems and, and what our outcomes are going to be up front and have all our requirements figured out. So fundamentally, all they're doing is, is doing waterfall with Agile development in the middle. And, and that really loses, you know, at least half the value of doing agile, right? So that's something we need to try and avoid. And that's a really also a very big cultural shift for people to make. Perfect, thank you so much. Before I go on to Mike next, I wanted to let the audience know that if you have questions, please leave them in the Zoom group chat. I'm checking that chat channel here. And if you have questions for the panelists, I'm happy to weave them into our conversation. So please feel free to use that venue as well. So coming around to you, Mike. Um, and thank you so much, Anne. Appreciate that. Yeah, it, I just want to build off of what uh, Anne and Rob said uh, in terms of uh, taking risks, being innovative, failing fast. These are things that aren't that federal staff aren't motivated to do. And <laughs> so a lot of a lot of what happens in Agile, like Anne, really hit the nail on the head is cultural change in terms of how things have been done in the past. And, and so there are different approaches, I think, that are being taken throughout the government um, to tackle this short term and tackle it long term. Um, changing feds and their behaviors is tough. Uh, and so um, potential ways to attack the problem is to find uh, and conduct like one of the things that I focus on is finding amazing partners for our in creating contract competitions for our um, uh, DHS components. So finding amazing partners that can hold the hand of federal programs and kind of take them on a journey to to get to that uh, uh, better way of doing things that will produce better outcomes. And so that way of changing culture um, is is one thing, but it all comes back to um, uh, people and finding ways to motivate them to change. And whether that's through finding a better partner or, um, or uh, finding some other way to motivate folks to go to that, to that better place. I mean, typically federal, st typically, <laughs> typically federal staff want to do amazing things that create better outcomes for their programs. And so I don't think it's a, it's a, a, a function of, 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 folks not wanting to do it. I think it's a, a matter of uh, providing uh, motivational factors um, additionally on top of that, so. I really like how you said, take big risks and fail fast. I think those are two things that strike terror into the heart of most people. Uh, so I, I really appreciate that you brought those two things up because I feel like those are barriers when people try to become very agile and change culture and the government's not prone to being um, risky. So makes sense. I'm going to come to Brent to wrap up this, this part of the discussion and then Anne, I'm going to come to you for a question from the audience. But before I come to you, I'm going to come to Brent first. Yeah, so um, I like to always reference the digital services playbook, which talks about building software incrementally 
uh, working, uh, getting working software into the hands of end users um, so that design and development people can um, change what they're doing so they make delightful products. Um, always working in automated testing and deployment so we get working software into production quickly. But just kind of very tactically at the contract level because I've been a contract nerd for a long time now and done things the, the wrong way and then learned how to do things the right way. The wrong way, um, and this was like a $62 million contract that I was in charge of awarding, was yeah, not understanding Agile or using the buzzwords and just kind of throwing them into the contract. I'm going to throw Agile and user-centered design. I'm going to put um, big data in there, kind of everything I could think of. It's just kind of the government requires this. But that doesn't have any teeth on it, and it doesn't actually mean that the, that the vendor knows how to do that. That as opposed to what we're doing right now, we're partnering with an agency, assisting them in a particular acquisition for building an MVP. We're negotiating with the vendor alongside uh, the agency, and we're coming back and kind of telling them, okay, uh, we've talked a little bit about the potential deliverables. Now tell us exactly from like soup to nuts, your agile uh, process. Because what we want to be buying is increments of, of that service. So that you know when you're starting with user-centered design all the way through um, your, your whole kind of scrum process through testing, what is the definition of done, where do you move? Like I wanna know the entire process, spell it out. And uh, for a contract wise, I'm not, you're, as you as a contract, you're probably not gonna get paid until kind of all that process is met. Um, so we're buying that repeatable process, which is kind of clearly articulated in their, the vendor's performance work statement. Thank you for that, Brent. We're actually seeing that quite a bit, where the vendors are getting paid sprint by sprint after the definition of done is met. So that's a trend that I've started to see. So thank you. Appreciate that. Um, coming around to the question from the audience, this is from Tim. It's for Anne. How is the transformation different in local government versus federal government? Are we facing the same issues? So, uh, so I think a lot of the issues are the same. So Tim, thank you for that question. So the cultural challenges, many of them are the same, right? Um, many of the things that motivate, demotivate government employees are, are exactly the same uh, at the local, state, and federal levels. But there are some things that are different. Um, you know, within the, and I can only, all my local government experiences in, within the state of California, so I can only speak to that experience in California, but my suspicion is from talking to other CIOs, it's a fairly transferable experience. And that is um, that some of the constraints are less on uh, state, uh, state and local folks because you know, the, the federal government's portfolio management processes and the way we manage projects sort of tends to drive people into a uh, waterfall, right? So all the planning processes, all the prep process, all the things you have to do really drive people to waterfall. Same local governments, particularly the local governments, aren't as constrained in that way. My project management process, my portfolio management process, it's all under my control. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't need the amount of overhead I need to have in the federal government to plan a project. So I do have a lot more flexibility that way. And um, my team has the ability, particularly when we're dealing with projects that don't require procurement, really have the ability to pick up new projects in our Mode 2 team really quickly and, and get, that, get that stuff done uh, very rapidly. But when we get to our monolithic, our, our, our old monolithic projects, the big stuff, it gets more challenging in some ways. Um, first of all, um, there's a tremendous amount of package software uh, that, that state and local governments tend to have. Um, and that, that, you know, implementing that in an agile process is extremely difficult. We've been talking a lot about how to do that. But even when you get to development, um, in the federal government, you get a budget for IT. And generally speaking, it's broken into some big buckets. In the local government, it's, it's a project by project budget. So if I decide I want to work on project A, and then I want to stop working on project A because it's just not something we want to do, or I want to fund it incrementally because that's my, my agile process, that's very hard to do when you have to go back to the Board of Supervisors or the governor or whoever is funding you for every single project. So I think there, there are things that are easier and there are things that are more constrained. 
Thank you so much, Anne. I, I definitely appreciate that. And thank you to the audience for sending in questions. I'm going to apologize in advance if I don't get to everybody's question. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for that, Anne. Um, I think one of the things that um, we tend to forget about as we are contractors is that even though we are interfacing with the government, the government, the government folks have customers as well. Just like what you said, you have your constituents, you have your people that you report up to, and it's ultimately their money. So, and well, it's, it's all of our money, right? We all pay taxes, <laughs> let's be real. So um, I appreciate that answer. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so this is, um, this is actually a, a really good question and it ties, it's from the audience and it ties into one of the things that Rob had mentioned. And it says one of the barriers to doing agile with the federal government is not having a Gavi do the PO role. How would you handle that issue? And the reason why I'm bringing this question up is because Rob's, Rob's point was your PO should be the product owner, your end user. And technically, the PO in Agile, they say, shouldn't be the customer. But if it's the end user, it is your customer. So I think that's kind of the, where this question is going to, is if it's assigned to a business analyst or a scrum master in a dual role or the product owner is an extremely important role, how do we make sure the right person is doing it to get to the most effective agile process as possible? Maybe that's the best way to encapsulate that question. Rob? So, so I'd say two, two things. One is, um, uh, I'll come at this question sort of, uh, you know, backwards, and that is one symptom of not having the right product owner is if you find yourself getting towards the middle of the project and, um, you know, the sort of classic, uh, the business starts complaining that IT doesn't, isn't paying attention to them. If, if you're getting that buzz, then that means that you don't have the right product owner. So, you know, those people that would be doing the complaining should own the product so that if they're having a problem with it, it's, it's partly their pro it's, you know, it's, they're the owner, it's partly their problem. If you have a business analyst doing this, then you still run the risk of, um, of alienating the real product owner and not making the headway that you need. The second thing I'll say is that, I'll give you a, you know, real life example at the Social Security Administration, we were building a, um, a system that did disability determination and we have outsourced by law disability determination to all the states. And so the real product owners were uh, people in all the states and territories. And we actually put together a steering committee that, had, that was a real steering committee, not a steering committee where you know, once a quarter, we would all get together and have dinner and, and yuck it up and see PowerPoint slides, but where we would actually uh, have the steering committee looking at demos of the software. And we asked those people to provide uh, product owner staff that were actually involved in the sprint reviews every two weeks. And so we had our real life customer engaged uh, all time, every week, in, in this product owner role. And it's what really made the difference in the project. I mean, developers can good, build good code and all that sort of stuff. But if you don't have the real life end users, if you don't have the product owners be owners, um, then I think you run the risk of it just being another IT driven project with the, the you know, where the, the people that really are the owners feel like they're just being uh, treated as second or third class citizens. Thank you so much, Rob, for that one. I'm going to offer this question up to Mike and Brent and Anne. If you guys have anything else you would like to add about how do you get to the real, the right product owner to drive the best results? Yeah, I'll, I'll just mention something really quickly and then jump and let Mike have it. <laughs> um, you know, we had a similar problem in uh, EPA where we had the e-manifest program and the real customers, the real product owners, um, were the waste haulers and the waste uh, create producers. Um, we couldn't bring them to the table as the defined, you know, the product owner to sit at the table, but we also didn't want the stakeholders to be that. So we did create an advisory committee. It's a, it's a harder thing to do when they're not government employees. Um, but we, we then sent people out to talk to them, to listen to them, and that fundamentally changed the design of the product. So I think sometimes you just have to get creative about how you bring the product owners on board and how you make sure you have someone on your team even if they're not literally the product owner, 
can represent the voice of the product owner on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, and the only thing I'll have to add to that is, I mean, we, we see this repeatedly in the folks that we, that in the projects that we get involved in, um, that, um, and, and the, the thing that keeps coming up that I, I've noticed is that there really isn't a lot of training within the federal government to tell people how to be product owners. And so, um, you know, are we expecting people to know how to do it walking into the government? Um, I, so I think it's a, again, it's a cultural shift, right? And um, that's starting to happen. And I think um, those out there, the folks out there are realizing that, listen, uh, we need better product owners, but we also need to tell them how to do it. Um, and so I guess that's where I'll leave that. That makes a lot of sense. So that kind of brings me to Brent on this topic. Um, Brent, when you are putting these contracts out and you're, you know, you're advising people on how to procure, you know, agile increments and, and, and sprints and agile teams, do you usually see the product owner as being a part of the contractor team or do you see it as being something that the government is going to supply from a user standpoint and user standpoint? Um, yeah, so we, we'd expect for the, the government to, to provide the, the product owner. Um, in most cases, what we've seen, um, that uh, it's usually a project manager uh, or program manager within the government. They may, not have, they may have gone to one class or something like that, but have no actual experience being a product owner. Um, so we think it's actually pretty helpful when you know, soliciting a vendor to actually put it in your statements of objectives that you are looking for a vendor with skills that will not only help to build a particular product, which is of course gonna help um, the government learn best, um, to bring it from kind of book work into actually building a, building a product is gonna be really helpful. But also those, those vendors that know and will able to kind of hold the government's hand as they go along and kind of teach a product owner what he or she should be. That sounds great. Thank you so much Alexa, for that. Alexa, can I jump in yep. and add one quick thing? Absolutely, Rob. I think it would be great. Sure. So, so what I'd just like to add is that um, um, the, the product owner can provide a check and a balance on the vendor that's doing the development. You know, in the old, one of the side effects of the old school waterfall thing is that the development vendor own requirements and, and owned the entire process all the way through uh, to acceptance testing and, and, and maybe there was an outside acceptance test criteria. I think one of the, this is one of the sort of subtle side effects of Agile that I think is really powerful and that is that if you get a proper product owner, that becomes a check and a balance on the engineering vendors. So, so I would agree with what Brent just said. I would just suggest that there be a, a different vendor who's trying to help the product owner perform their role than the vendor that is responsible for engineering. Otherwise the conflict of interest can lead you to not the best results. Yeah, and just to build off of that, it seems like there's been an uptick recently in agile coaching types of solicitations. I know DHS just put one out uh, for enterprise-wide agile coaching, um, the seed contract. And so that may be one mechanism to make a difference um so but that's just a, a trend i've noticed that's how we're doing yeah it in the state I, of California. I, yeah i think i've i mean my question for for you then both of you would be inside of your agile coaching contract is there a portion of that that revolves around how to be a product owner how to be a good product owner what does it mean who's supposed to own that role and how does that role play into the product team play into the development team how is it all tied together um and, you know is that clearly spelled out or are you purchasing like blanket agile coaching services uh, i don't have the contract in front of me uh, but um i'm i'm guessing it depends from in terms of the maturity of each organization. Uh, one thing that DHS components don't seem to be very uh, react to, uh, not so positively, is when you tell them what they should be and how they should be uniform across. There are, there are unity of effort um, um, 
things that need to be uniform across DHS, but we have a, uh, a federation of components that uh, that form DHS and um, they have unique missions. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so to a point, uh, uh, that is a challenge that, that we, that we mm -hmm. tackle on a daily basis. So, yeah. So, Makes so sense. I, I would, I, I would I, add that I think yep. that, that um, you could do it any which what way. I mean, um, it depends as, as you said, mm -hmm. but the, the thing that I would suggest is that if you're going for agile coaching, there's probably three different kinds of coaching that you're likely to need. We we're talking now about coaching the product owner and how to be the right product owner. Of course, there's sort of the classic agile coaching, which is, you know, that you need scrum masters that can go help developers figure out how to be effective in the development cycle um, of agile. But I think the third one that's really worth pointing out is that there's, um, if there's a, if there's a gap in the government around uh, how to be a product owner, there is an equal or larger gap in how to be a product manager. And in some ways, being product manager is the key role on an Agile project. So I would say when you go get Agile coaches, try to find a company that can service all three of those roles and responsibilities. <clears throat> Absolutely, Rob. I appreciate that. That's a very, very good point. Um, yeah, thank you for that. So the next question I have is, how can the government shift from command and control over to servant leadership? And um, when we were defining Agile, nobody really talked about servant leadership, but I heard the word Scrum Master brought up a few times today. So I think one of the roles of a Scrum Master is to be a servant leader. And it's one of the things that we try to promote in Agile. So um, after Mike brought up the good point of fail fast and take risks, how does the government go from command and control over to servant leadership and how can contractors be a support to that? Uh, me? <laughs> okay. Sure, sure. I mean, it, whoever, anybody, anybody, it's a question, throw it out. So. In, but I'll put in my two cents in terms sure. of vendors and how they can support, uh, how they can support our mission spaces and, and handhold. I, I mean, Brent hit it right on the nail earlier when he was talking about that being a strategy for, for the easiest short-term solution for taking our programs and maturing maturing them in terms of their understanding and implementation of agile strategies. And that's where I'll end my comments. I'll hand it off to anybody else who wants to chime in more on that. Perfect. So, anybody else? Um, so I think, you know, just like command and control starts at the top, uh, you know, servant leadership or whatever you would like to call it um, in terms of, of allowing people to, to manage themselves and manage their own work. Um, start to the top as well. So, you know, we talk a lot about empowering people and I don't even like the word empowerment because it still means I'm doing something to you, right? I'm empowering you to do your work. Um, <laughs> what we really wanna do is give people the agency to feel like they have the authority to go out and do the work themselves, to make mistakes, um, to make decisions and that we're there to support them. And so the way, only way you do that is by demonstrating that you're doing it, right? It's, it's you know, it's almost catch 22, but it's a, you find people in the organization who are willing to take a chance and then you back them, right? And, and as people see that you have backed your staff, you've given them the empowerment, the, the authority to do work themselves, um, to make decisions on their own, um, and that when they fail, there are not negative consequences, but in fact, uh, as long as they didn't do something silly, right? We talk to people about, you know, take risks, but make sure they're intelligent risks, make sure you talk to people about those risks, make sure you're thoughtful about it. As long as people are doing those things and then they fail, we say, okay, we failed. What did we learn from that? And we move on. And as soon as people start to see that in fact, um, you are supporting your staff, you are, you know, what we used to call it HP, um, was that leaders um, clear roadblocks and carry water. As long as you start doing that for people, as long as they see you in that role, um, the organization will start to change. But it has to start from the top. And like almost any change, um, it can start from the top and, and it's often embraced uh, at the individual trigger level and your middle managers are your most challenging people in the organization because middle managers jobs by definition are to protect their turf. Right? And so they're not very interested in change because what they're interested in is protecting the status quo and protecting their turf and making sure that their organization continues to function and be successful. 
And so sort of the, lead, the, the senior leadership has to gang up on the middle managers in a very nice, kind, and thoughtful way to, in order to make sure that they have the support for the folks at the, uh, on the front lines who are trying to make change. One of the organizations within DHS that exists that is an example of what Ann just said is the DHS Procurement Innovation Lab. And that is a place where you can fail <laughs> and you won't get hammered over the head. And the leadership will protect you with everything that they got. And they've shown that. And I think it's really paid off in terms of uh, the acquisition community really being willing to do some unusual cool things that, um, that uh, they wouldn't have done a year or two ago in terms of, uh, and it really benefits the program offices that, that want to get innovative, cool products and services in to support their different mission areas. Um, and of course that benefits industry being able to break through as well. Absolutely. And, and Mike, I have to say as a federal contractor, you know, participating in a lot of your fun, cool procurements, um, it, it really has earned you guys a pretty nice reputation for being one of the more agile agencies in the federal government. So absolutely would keep up the good work as far as that goes. <laughs> doing fun, failing fast and doing cool stuff. I'd sure. like to chime in a little bit on the servant leadership thing. Um, the, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think that the, you know, in the government, there's lots of people that are happy to be servants and the issue isn't about, it's, it's about the leadership side. Um, and, and, and this all sort of ties back again into the philosophy of Agile and this idea of fail fast. Um, you know, the, the idea of being a developer is, in, working in a sprint is that you can write code in the first week of the sprint and show it to the product owner and have the product owner say, that's not what I want. And that is failing fast. Failing fast isn't running an agile program for six months and then failing. Failing fast is um, delivering uh, the result that you think you're supposed to deliver at the end of a two week sprint and having the business, the product owner say, that's not what I want. That's, the, that's what failing fast is. And so it's these really small two week increments of, of um, failing and adjusting that end up with the right end result. And, and I think some people, people lose sight of the fact that, that fail fast means two week increments. It doesn't mean six month increments. The, the second thing I'd say is, um, um, you, you know, that, that um, you know, there's this sort of ambiguity with agile and that's really what breaks the command and control idea. Um, you know, the fact that, uh, at the end of a product increment, I might actually change the priority of the features that I want to do in the next increment from what was originally planned uh, and, and just make an adjustment and deliver something that might be fundamentally different the, than what the original perspective was. That's what sort of breaks the command and control thing. And, and, and now you put these two things together and really what ends up happening is these decisions are made at a low level. They're not made at the middle management level. The middle managers, all they can do is sort of track velocity and try to, um, you know, like super scrum masters make velocity better, but, but they, they don't have command and control anymore. It just doesn't work that way in Agile. And so, you, you know, it, it, it is a cultural shift, but Agile forces the shift if you do it right. You don't have to, um, you know, hire a psychiatrist to get that cultural shift to happen. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rob. I appreciate that. I have a question from the audience, and I think it kind of pertains to this exact topic that we're talking about. What can employees who are on the front lines who have embraced Agile do to help get their leadership to buy into the philosophical change? So that's a, that's a really good question. Um, in fact, I'll tell you a quick story. I was at the SEC, and they said, if you keep bringing that word up one more time, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, I, you know, and maybe everybody's in a different uh, buy-in of the fact that Agile is successful, but what do you do if you have some employees that are like front lines and they think Agile's the, the next thing that would help the agency be more um, successful? How do you give them that airtime? How do you give them the cover? Or like Mike said, he's got a group there. 
where they give them cover to do new things. Um, how do you how do you do that? So I guess I'll I'll jump in and first of all, hi Noha, the, the questioner there, someone from another another EPA or there. Hmm. Um, I think that you know it's a lot about what I talked about uh, before, but I think. Um, I think it's a really interesting challenge, right? If you if you try and embrace agile um, at the staff level with no uh, management support, uh, I think it's difficult but not impossible. What, what we saw when we, we embraced agile uh, agency wide at EPA was some people who who sort of said quietly, meekly, "Oh, we were doing agile, but we were afraid to tell anybody." Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so they were just off in their corner doing agile, but they didn't want anyone to know because they were afraid they were going to get told to stop. Um, so, and I think that's what tends to happen when there's not organizational support is that people just quietly do it and they don't tell anybody that they're actually doing agile. And so, you know, they end up doing kind of, in a lot of cases, agile fall because they can't do agile for the whole thing. Sometimes they have small projects and they don't have a contract with an outside vendor and they can actually do agile quietly on their own. Um, I think you need to find a sponsor in, in the leadership. If your leadership isn't pushing it, you've got to find someone in the, in the leadership team, um, middle manager or an executive who's going to say, yeah, I think this is a good idea and I'm going to sponsor you for it. Um, because, and, and the way that I think you get that sponsorship is to show results, right? Here's what we actually did while we were hiding in our corner and pretending we weren't doing agile and look at how much faster we did this project and these other things, look at this great results we got. Uh, and, to, and to demonstrate the value of Agile to folks to get them to buy in. I think it's a different problem if you have executive leadership and then, you know, the middle managers on board, as I, as I talked about before. And part of the problem with getting middle managers on board, which Rob sort of mentioned sort of obliquely, was it changes the job of middle managers. Not only is their job to protect turf, but, you know, we just had this conversation here as we're doing a reorganization. And um, the, 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 folk, the, the person who has our main group of Agile developers said, well, I don't know what to do with this management job because it's a crappy job, basically. You know, when you're going to be the manager who manages the five Agile teams, you have nothing interesting. And I said, well, Emma, there are people who might think that job is interesting, but someone who's a development manager is probably not going to find that job interesting. So if you've got middle management who's used to being leading development organizations, they are disempowered by Agile in the sense of the way they used to work, right? They're used to being engaged in this process that's now just everybody's doing their thing and they don't need them anymore. They need them to clear roadblocks and carry water. They need them to deal with the budget. They need them to go fight political battles. They don't need them to help do development. And some of them don't like it very much, right? So I think that's a huge challenge getting those folks on board. Um, and, and sometimes it's a matter of getting that to be switched out to a person who's happy to do that kind of work instead of being deeply engaged in development. So you said two things that you said some things that made me think of two things. One is um, related to storytelling as you're going through this transformation and metrics that will support the transformation that is not thought of upfront so many times. And so if you're going through a transformation, uh, whether it's cultural or trying to get trying to develop, deploy, get better outcomes for your program. At the end, you want to tell a story, right? So it's important. Uh, we've, we've seen uh, folks go through those programs. And that's even more important when you don't have that leadership level um, support and you're trying to make a case for uh, a cultural change um, and justify the, the awesome outcomes that you're getting or tell a story. And the second thing that it made me think of is the, uh, the, uh, the, well, at DHS, it's called MD-102, the over the big A acquisition and uh, process, um, which, which has gates, which has for reviewing a program, different artifacts, and it's built in a more, it's designed and built in a more traditional waterfall um, sense. And the program management training that is, that is currently in deployment is uh, focused on that. Um, I think uh, that uh, the training community is, uh, has been looking for a little while at finding ways to weave agile concepts into that oversight process. But again, it motivates people to stay 
to stay and focus on those waterfall concepts that are baked into the oversight processes for all their programs. Um, but what you what you had mentioned uh, reminded me of that and how our CTO <clears throat> shop at DHS is actually focusing on six pilot pro programs. Uh, Mike Hermes is his shop um, has been working on that for like the last two two years and uh, really testing out some new ways to do uh, the big A acquisition side of of uh, program management and acquisition oversight. You just you just kicked the ball off so perfectly for my next question. It was like perfect. So thank you for that. My next question, and we only have 15 more minutes of discussion. This hour flies. I knew it was going to fly by, but it's definitely flying by. So the next question is, how can we bridge the understanding gap between the program office and the contracting office as it pertains to agile procurement? So, you know, having been a federal contractor for the past 10 years, um, I think understanding bridging the understanding gap between the program office and the con contracting office in general has been something that the contractors have always um, wanted to improve. But as it pertains to agile procurement, um, kind of what you were saying, Mike, and what Brent, what you spend your entire job doing. Um, so maybe this is a question we can start with Brent with how do we, wh where are we? Where are we in that whole program, the program office, the contracting office, and how do we get those two to, to, to come together? Right. So uh, typically, um, program offices will will write up what they need and throw it over a wall to procurement, and they won't know anything about it until that point. And then they're under the gun to write a contract before the existing contract expires, and uh, no work is getting done. So <laughs> it's fire after fire. Um, and and also the contracting people don't know how to buy modern tech. So the U.S. Digital Service recognized this a few years ago. It's a market research. We saw that. There's plenty of training out in the commercial space about how to make, uh, build modern tech and modern tech approaches. And then on the federal government side, um, when you learn to do procurement, you learn the basic regulations and you can buy kind of anything. You can buy pencils, you can buy tanks. And unfortunately, the, the process as far as buying things, they apply it across the board. So believe it or not, the government buys software the same way it buys tanks. Now, tanks were only used by the military. Software did not come from the government, okay? So, like, we should be um, building and buying software the same way that it's done in the commercial space, as much as humanly possible, uh, yet it's still being within the federal acquisition regulations or whatever your regulations are in the state. And in the federal space, there's actually a lot of leeway. You just need to start thinking creatively and looking to the commercial sector as much as possible. So we created this training program. It's called Digital IT Acquisition Professional uh, DITAP. And it's about five months long. Um, IT professionals uh, get signed up for this. So they learn the technology. They learn you know, what is Agile, what is Scrum, what is Kanban, what is user-centered design, what is cloud, what is DevOps, and then specifically how to buy it, how to how to develop acquisition strategies around it. Um, they learn about how to look for the right vendors, how to identify the right vendor pool, um, how to break down barriers to entry for vendors that are already out there building great products, but don't want to do business with the government because it's extremely difficult and very costly. Um, so when they come out of this program, um, they receive a certificate and we're, we're working with the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, who we work with to develop this program, um, to make this kind of an official certificate. Um, and our, our grand scheme, if we get our way, is that procurements over a certain dollar amount will require a contracting officer to actually have this certificate. So we've got about 55 people trained so far. We've uh, graduated two cohorts and we've kind of packaged that uh, information up, all the curriculum and been meeting with vendors um, so that training vendors can sell it back to the government to literally train thousands of IT contracting officers over the next few years. That's our hope, our goal. In addition, we're tra talking to some of the, the agencies that have major training programs. So the VA, the DOD, DHS, their kind of training programs and trying to kind of sell it to them saying, look, this is on the horizon. Your IT contracting officers, we feel like they would hugely benefit uh, here and kind of help your organization to move towards digital transformation because usually it's contracts that gets in the way 
of facilitating modern tech getting into the government. Sounds good, Brent. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, our other panelists, Rob and or Mike, did you guys have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'd like to chime in. I, I'd like, I think there's another really interesting opportunity to tie contracts and the program office together and, and also to help with a bunch of other things. And that is both at Social Security and here in California, the cor one of the cornerstones of the way we're implementing Agile is to build what we call a modern development environment. And simply what a modern development environment is, is is a, you know, a source control management uh, capability, let's just say GitHub, tied to an orchestration capability, which typically is something like Jenkins. And the idea is that we, instead of letting the development vendors come in with their own development environment, we say, no, you have to use our source control management capability. And when you check your code into GitHub, uh, we're going to automatically orchestrate a build and unit test and acceptance tests. We're going to automatically scan for cyber vulnerabilities and profile the code to make, make sure it meets our standards. And um, the, the side effect that makes this really important for the program office is all of a sudden you have complete and total transparency into what the developers are doing. Every day you know how much code was checked in you know whether the code passed tests or didn't pass tests. You know whether they checked in unit tests so that you can enforce test-driven development techniques in order to get the quality up. All of these sort of things all fit together, but it creates perfect transparency. So instead of going to the vendor uh, for weekly status and getting a PowerPoint that's always got a bunch of green on it, um, you can actually see uh, every day how much code is being checked in and what the quality of that code is and um, that transparency uh, is something that you can that 12 months from now uh, the vendor's going to say, gosh, we're really sorry. We're just, you know, six months behind schedule. You can see every day if they're behind schedule. And so that transparency, you know, it just completely changes everybody's <clears throat> behavior. By the way, the developers, when they see that every time they check in code, um, it's every other developer can see it, it changes their behavior. So everybody changes in a world where it's, that's transparent. People start focusing more on results and they stop trying to, hide what could be just a short-term failure. So I think right. a modern development environment that is um, owned by the agency, not owned by the development vendor, is really critical to providing a transparent view and uh, the progress on your product development. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much, Rob, I appreciate that. <clears throat> I have a question here that ties into this question then from the audience, and I think this will probably take us straight to the end. We've got seven minutes. So the question is, Agile focuses more on people and teams rather than documentation. So how can you keep the people and teams intact when the contract is coming to an end and a transition is required? And then how do you prepare for the transition? So the reason why I'm reading this question is because when we were talking a little bit earlier, I think Rob was talking about it, as you move these applications, when they get built into operations and maintenance, are we still doing agile? Are we doing two-week sprints on O&M? That's something that I've, <laughs> I've seen a lot, actually. Coast Guard contracts, by the way, Mike brought that up. Um, so um, that's, a, that's a good question. And, and while, we're, while you have your really awesome teams that did such a good job building that, that product out, do you just roll them off? Do you roll them onto something else? How do you prep your contractors and how do you prep, how do you, how do you, how do we do that? That's what this question's asking. So, so let me, let me give you the quick answer from the development perspective and then I'll let the contract guys try to figure out how they're going to deal with what I'm going to say. I mean, imagine that you have, again, we, I used an example where I had, you know, four agile teams with seven people on it uh, running at a rate of $10 million a year. And let's just imagine that it's a 22 year, $20 million thing to get to sort of the minimum viable product, or at least to the point where you can retire the legacy system. 
um, you don't go into MO, you go to DevOps. And DevOps is dev, it's not maintenance, it's not life support. You still have a backlog of user stories, the backlog still gets prioritized. In other words, the mechanics of the project don't change at all. But what you might do is go from four sprint teams of seven to one sprint team of four. And so you just scale because agile you know, is so elastic, you just scale down, but you continue to try to constantly support and maintain and extend and improve the product uh, ongoing. And so we're actually in the process of trying to do something contractually here in the state of California. I don't know how it's going to come out, but the idea will be that we will create contracts that might uh, run for two years at a high run rate. And then the contract would just scale for some number of years uh, down to a smaller team doing DevOps. And then maybe only after a couple of years of DevOps does the contract end and you look for another contractor to pick up the DevOps ongoing. Hmm. So I think the important concept when you're thinking about this is in your product orientation, you don't go to m and you, you go to, you roll it out into production and then dev becomes DevOps. Got it. Thank you so much for that, Rob. Um, we only have maybe three more minutes. So before those minutes are gone, I just want to say that this video will be sent out in email form and will also be available on all of our social media. So if anybody wanted to forward it out or watch it again, you'll have that opportunity. Um, so for the last three minutes, does anybody else want to pitch in and answer this question, which then we will end promptly on time. So thank you, Rob. And then <laughs> anybody else have anything else? I'll add 30 seconds, which is that we had a debate internally about uh, for our internal development teams on this topic um, that, that they wanted our, our internal developer agile teams wanted shared services to take on support and maintenance of their products. And we said, no, you keep them in part because we feel like what better way to encourage those teams to develop um, all the tools they need to test and to make sure they build supportable codes than to maintain their own code. Yeah, and from up in the federal space, I haven't seen uh, an a clear understanding of the sophistication of, of what Rob's describing. And um, it's, it is how things should operate. Um, but currently, a lot of what's being described still does do some sort of handoff to an O&M type of, especially on larger systems. Um, and so, I'll, and that translates into how we describe how the uh, contract support that we would need. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Michael. And with that, I want to say thank you to all of our amazing panelists. As you can see from the group chat, everybody's saying thank you also for super valuable time today. I'm going to wrap it up. Um, so thank you so much. We'll send the video out, everybody. Take care and have a great day and appreciate you being a part of the Agile. Come live. Bye, guys. Thanks.